All right, all right. Well, welcome. Uh, welcome to Chapter 2. Uh, this is the lecture for Chapter 2 in Operations Management. Chapter 2 is all about uh, competitiveness, strategy, and productivity. So those are the topics that we are going to tackle tonight or today. Uh, so... Chapter 2, Learning Objectives, guys. Several ways uh, that business organizations compete. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to name several reasons that businesses, uh, business organizations fail. Mission and strategy, explain why they're important. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about organizational strategy and operation strategy. Explain, let's talk about why they link together. Uh, we're going to look at some time-based strategies, uh, as well as some other strategies as well. Um, we're going to define the term productivity, all right, and explain why it is important to organizations. Uh, we're also going to describe several factors that affect productivity. So that's uh, on the agenda for today. Uh, a cold, hard fact right out of the gate, better quality. Higher productivity, lower cost, and the ability to respond quickly to customers' needs are more important than ever. And truth of the matter is, guys, the bar is getting higher and higher and higher. Uh, so set a goal for your life, for your business life, to set that bar high, high, high. All right, so that's the code. It's when it comes to quality, productivity, cost, all those things. Uh, so, chapter focus here, our chapter two, it focuses, as I've already mentioned, on three separate, but they are related ideas, and they are vitally important to business operations. And they are competitiveness, strategy, and productivity. All right, so that's chapter two. Let's start by looking at competitiveness, competition. Uh, most of you are on sports teams, so a competitor or being a competitor, competition is a part of an athletic field, a basketball court, a soccer field, a baseball diamond. Uh, so we understand competitiveness, uh, but in business, competitiveness is how effectively an organization meets the wants and the needs of customers uh, relative to others that offer similar goods or services. So organizations compete, you know, through uh, some, comb some combination of either marketing and operations functions. You know, what do, uh, what do customers want? How can these customer, uh, how can these, how can the customer's needs best be satisfied. Uh, when you think about competition, take Home Depot, for example. Home Depot's major competition would be Lowe's, right? Uh, that's, they're basically the same store, just different colors and a different name. Uh, McDonald's would not be a Home Depot competitor. Uh, McDonald's is in the fast food industry, whereas Home Depot is in the hardware uh, industry. Ace Hardware, we mentioned in class, would be an example of a competitor for Home Depot. Uh, now, even in like industries, for example, the food industry, take McDonald's, for example. Uh, McDonald's would be considered a fast food. Uh, we have a fine dining restaurant here in Central Arkansas called the Butcher Block. All right, when you go to the Butcher Block, you sit down, you, you have a server, and uh, it's an environment. It's a fine dining experience. Uh, Butcher Block would really not be a major competitor for McDonald's. Even though they are in the food industry, uh, the food industry has different levels, right? You have fine dining, and then you have fast food. Uh, so Burger King, Taco Bell, these fast food restaurants would be a competitor for Mickey D's, all right, McDonald's. The market influences 
how a business advertises, how a business markets their product or service does influence business strategy and uh, business operations. Identifying consumers' needs and or wants, pricing and quality, advertising and promotion. These are the elements where the marketing efforts of an organization influence operations. Um, now, when you think about customers' needs and wants, uh, I posed this question in class, and I pose it to you here. And that is, when it comes to customer retention, which has a tighter grip on retaining that customer is it their wants or their needs that are going to hold tighter and uh, possibly keep them as a customer? All right. Well, the answer is needs. All right. And the reason that needs has a tighter grip than wants is because needs are things that you got to have. Wants you do not have to have. Uh, so if a consumer is in a financial crunch, let's say, where they don't have a lot of money in a particular month to spend, or they foresee that their financial situation is changing, they're going to look to make some changes in their financial spending. And those changes are going to first start at the want side of the equation. The things that they want, uh, but they don't need, are going to go by the wayside quicker than the needs. They're going to hold on to those needs as long as they possibly can. Why? Because they need them. They need them. But these are the different elements of the marketing influence, marketing's influence uh, on business operations. Now, business uh, businesses compete using operations. Uh, they compete through product and service design. Uh, they compete through cost, location, quality, uh, quick response and flexibility, inventory management, supply chain management, and then, you know, service, and then lastly, managers and workers. All of these uh, discussed in your textbook, so be sure and look at these. But these are the different points or some of the different points where organizations compete using operations. Uh, now, why do some organizations fail? Why do they fail? Well, neglecting operation strategy. All right. Uh, strategy, we will learn and we will see in just a moment that strategy is uh, sort of uh, how you're going to get something accomplished. Uh, so if you neglect planning all right if you neglect developing a strategy you've heard the old saying if you uh, fail to plan you're planning to fail all right so uh, neglecting operation strategy is why some organizations fail some fall uh, some fail to take advantage of the strengths and opportunities or failing to recognize competitive threats. Uh, we're going to talk about today the SWOT analysis a little bit, uh, but that has to do with strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, too much emphasis on short-term financial performance. Uh, you know, if you, don't have, uh, uh, if you don't have a vision, a goal that, that is long-term, uh, that may be a, a good reason for your organization's failure. Uh, I worked for a company called Fan Sales and Leasing. We leased to own furniture and appliances. <coughs> we were sort of like a uh, upscale rent one. You've seen a company called Aaron's Furniture and Appliances. Uh, that was the same type of store. And we leased furniture to consumers on a weekly basis short term and our financial perspective was on that short term and i think it was that perspective 
which ultimately drove the company to needing to sell out to a co to a competitor, and they they did sell out to um, Aaron's Home Furnishings. Uh, so, you know, short-term financial performance is something you definitely want to look at, but it's not something that you really want to use to drive long-term strategy and long-term success. Too much emphasis in product and service design and not enough on process design and, and improvement, another way organizations fail. Neglecting investment in capital and human resources. A happy employee is a productive employee. An employee with a good attitude is going to be uh, productive. An employee with a bad attitude or if an employee who is sad, an employee who is mad, um, upset, that's an employee whose productivity is going to fall. So you've got, as an organization, you have to invest in the human resource, the employees, uh, to improve their well-being, their attitudes, and so forth. Number six is failing to establish good internal communications and cooperation. With any relationship, folks, communication is key. Uh, so uh, you've got to keep those channels of communication open uh, so that you don't fall to an organizational failure status. Uh, and last there, failing to consider customer wants and needs. We talked about the wants and the needs. You know, if, if the, customer, the customer needs a vacuum, all right, but the customer wants a red vacuum, uh, not listening to that need of the customer that they wanted a red vacuum uh, and you get them a black vacuum, even though they need a vacuum cleaner, uh, you may find yourself at a deficit uh, because that red vacuum want may be a priority in that moment for the customer. So you have to consider both the wants and the needs of the consumer. All right, number next. The hierarchical planning, all right? Hierarchical, hierarchical planning, I can't say that word very good. I'm going to quit saying it because I'm making myself look stupid. But when we talk about this planning method here, we look, it starts with the mission. The mission drives the goals that we set for the organization, which then help us determine the organizational strategies that we want to implement and then we take the organizational strategy and we fine tune it for the different channels maybe, the different areas of our organization through functional strategies. And then our tactics are the actual things that we do, we implement so that the mission goals and strategy are successfully implemented and create productivity. All right, good deal, good deal, mission. Goals and strategy. Mission, that's the reason for an organization's existence. It answers the question, what business are we in? The goals provide detail and the scope of the mission. Goals can be viewed as organizational destinations. All right, number last there is strategy. And strategy, that's your plan for achieving your organizational goals. It's going to serve as a roadmap for reaching your organizational destinations. Uh, the organizational strategy guides the organization. Uh, the, um, the organization, all right, the organizational strategy guides the organization by providing direction for alignment of the goals and strategy of the functional units. And then the organizational strategy is a major success slash failure factor. All right. Uh, if you don't have a solid strategy game plan, you are sure to fall victim to non-productivity. All right. Non-productivity. So we talked about the mission. The mission, that's the reason for an organization's existence. Uh, the mission statement, that states the purpose of the organization. 
Uh, the mission statement should answer the question of what business are we in? All right. Take a look at this mission statement from Federal Express. Uh, FedEx Corporation will produce superior financial returns for its shareholders by providing high value added logistics, transportation, and related information services through focused operating companies. Uh, customer requirements will be met in the highest quality manner appropriate to each market segment served. FedEx Corporation will strive to develop mutually rewarding relationships with its employees, partners, and suppliers. Safety will be the first consideration in all operations. Corporate activities will be conducted to the highest ethical and professional standard. Uh, so a little wordy, uh, and it uses some, uh, some vague thoughts here in this mission statement, but yet still a pretty good mission statement for Federal Express. Uh, it tells us their direction and what they're in business to do. Another one I want to look at is Verizon. I used to work for Verizon. Uh, Verizon mission statement says that we deliver the promise of the digital world to our customers. We make their innovative lifestyles possible. We do it all through the most reliable network and the latest technology. All right, connecting. That's what, that was the big deal with Verizon is connection, wanting to connect people uh, through technology, through the network. All right. So the vision, the mission statement communicates, you know, where you're going and what you plan to do as an organization. Goals, you know, without goals, you have nothing to shoot for. Uh, the mission statement, that serves as the basis for the organizational goals. And uh, goals, listen, they provide that detail. They provide the scope of the mission. Uh, goals can be viewed as organizational destinations. Uh, think about a basketball court with me, if you would. Uh, at each end of a basketball court, there are baskets, all right? Uh, backboards and little rings called baskets with a net. And, uh, you know, those are the goals of the basketball game. Uh, you have to have the baskets in order to score points. If a basketball team stepped foot on a basketball court and there weren't any basketball goals, even though they had a basketball, even though they had a basketball court, they have a three-point line, a free throw line, they have benches, they have everything, they just don't have the baskets, the goals, then they can't, they can't play the game. They, they will not be able to score any points. Uh, so in business, all right, in business, goals can be viewed as those organizational destinations, the baskets to help an organization score and uh, make points or generate revenue, however you want to look at it. Uh, goals serve as the basis, as I mentioned, for organizational strategy. Now, strategies, once you have your goals in place, now you're moving to your strategy, and your strategy is the plan for achieving the organizational goals. It's uh, the coach gathers you around, says, everybody come around here. And he has this little little uh, whiteboard and he's drawn. And he's saying, you go here and then I want you to run around here and, and then go there. And then, bam, that's where I want you to, to score. Uh, so that's the strategy, strategi strategizing on the whiteboard. And, uh, and it serves as a roadmap for reaching the organi organizational destinations. Uh, Organizations have both organizational strategies and functional level strategies. Organizational strategies are those strategies that relate to the entire organization. Uh, they support the achievement of the organizational goals and the mission, where the functional level strategies are more uh, specifically defined as strategies that relate to each of the functional areas 
and that's that supported the achievement of the organizational strategy as well. You know, when I think about strategy, I am reminded of Don Haskins. And uh, folks, the year is uh, 1965, ni 1966. Uh, the school is Texas Western College in El Paso, Texas. Uh, the team was coached by now Hall of Famer Don Haskins. Uh, it's a basketball team. Uh, this was Don Haskins' first Division I college coaching opportunity. Before that, uh, he was a coach at a high school, a small high school in Texas, where he coached high school girls. Uh, the Texas Western Miners made history by winning the 1966 NCAA University Division Basketball Tournament, uh, national champions. Uh, they became the first team with an all-African-American starting lineup uh, to win the NCAA National Championship. Now, folks, in the 1960s, this was a time when racial segregation, racial discrimination was rampant. All right, NCAA basketball teams generally played more Caucasian players than they did uh, African-American players. Uh, that's just kind of the way it was. Not saying that the way it was was right, because it wasn't, but that's just uh, how it was in that time. But Don Haskins, he had a strategy that went against the norm and recruited and played seven African-American basketball players. And on December 30th, 1965, the Texas Western Miners, they were scheduled to face the number four ranked Iowa Hawkeyes. Uh, now, up to this point, Texas Western hadn't faced a top 10 team. They were 7-0, and all right? So they were undefeated at 7-0, and but they were going against number four Iowa Hawkeyes. So... Now, in 2006, the movie Glory Road came out. Now, if you have an opportunity to see this film, I encourage you to watch it. It's a good one. It came out, and it told this underdog story of the Texas Western Miners and their NCAA National Championship win of 1966. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's just take a look at what happened when the Texas Western Miners faced the number four Iowa Hawkeyes. We are midway through the first half. Iowa playing well, of course, that's to be expected. They're undefeated, number four in the country. <laughs> Iowa always a contender in the big game, and there's a bucket for the Hawkeyes. Coach Haskins is not happy. It's an eight-point game right now. Texas Western struggling to score against this tough Hawkeyes defense. And there's a great block just before the end. This reporter's seen a lot of rough hands in basketball, but the Myers are really struggling. They'll go to the locker room down by 16 points. Say it, Hill. Come on, he'll say it. We can't play like this. They're better than us at your game. You need to let us loose. Just stick to the plan, Bobby Joe. More fundamental basketball, right? Iowa is just let outplay Texas Western. It's been a difficult game so far. Hey, all right, coach. You feel time out. Time, time, time. Hey, my boy. We need to be fully on it. Coach. He loves to play our game. What? 
Yeah, let's do it. have <laughs> very good very good so why did i show you that why did i show you that well it's because the strategy that coach haskins implemented uh at the beginning of the season had got him seven wins and zero losses but against a top ranked iowa team his strategy was falling short and uh Bobby Joe came to him and said, look, man, you got to let us play our game, man. We can't play your game. You got to let us play our game. Uh, and uh, Coach Haskins at first was uh, rejective of that thought and said, hey, you play my game. But then when there was no productivity, when the points weren't going on the scoreboard, he said, okay, you play your game, but you play my game too. He, he adjusted his strategy so that he could win the game, ultimately win the game. And in business, guys, when it comes to steering the organization uh, towards productivity, which is the strategy, sometimes you have to make adjustments. When you face maybe competition, environmental circumstances, uh, both internal and external circumstances you may have to make some adjustments so that you can move towards productivity and win the game in business uh, now when we talk about tactics the tactics here and operations tactics are simply the methods it's the actions to accomplish the strategies uh, the the how to right how to do something part of the process whereas operations is actually the doing part of the process core competencies a business's or an organization's core competencies these are also often referred to as core values all right these are the special attributes or abilities 
that give an organization the, their competitive advantage or a competitive edge. Uh, to, be, uh, to be effective, core company, competencies and strategies need to be aligned. If you're going to be effective, then your, your core values have to line up with your strategy, business strategies. Uh, look at some sample operations strategies. Uh, the far left column there is your organizational strategy. The very first one there is the low price. That's the overall strategy over the organization is to have a low price. Uh, the operations strategy, how that is put into action is through pricing at low cost. What are some examples of companies or services that have implemented the organizational and operations strategy of low price, low cost? Well, your United States Postal Service and Walmart. Uh, Walmart is all about low prices. They used to, you see it in their commercials. You see it uh, when you visit the stores. Uh, that is definitely their organizational strategy. Responsiveness there, short processing times, on-time delivery. Uh, your or, uh, organizational strategy is that responsiveness, whereas your operation strategy is the short processing times, the on-time delivery. Uh, McDonald's restaurants, right? That's that short processing time. They, that's uh, McDonald's was the restaurant that was instrumental in the phrase fast food. Uh, FedEx, on-time delivery. Uh, and then you have different areas of differentiation. And differentiation is a operation strategy where an, an organization attempts to be different, to stand out from the competition. Uh, differentiation in the area of high quality. That's talking about high performance design, consistent quality, uh, like Sony Television. Uh, and uh, consistent quality Coca-Cola. Uh, back in the 80s, Coca-Cola tried to change its uh, formula, and they offered new Coke, but it bombed. So they have been <laughs> consistent with their Coca-Cola brand and the consistent quality there. Differentiation and newness, that's, that's innovation. Uh, that's like the Apple... Uh, and a lot of technology companies are trying to differentiate themselves from the competition through innovation. And then you've got the others there that you can read. These are some sample operation strategies and how they relate to the example of companies or services. You know, strategy formulation, putting together that strategy you really need to, uh, you need to effectively um, consider your core values or your core competencies and then environmental scanning. And environmental scanning is that, that SWOT analysis that I mentioned uh, at the beginning of class. Uh, and SWOT, S-W-O-T, strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats and we're going to talk more about that in in just a moment or two but effective strategy formulation requires taking into account core competencies and environmental scanning uh, successful strategy formulation also requires taking into account what we call order qualifiers and order winners so what are we talking about well, the order qualifiers are the characteristics that customers perceive as minimum standards of acceptability for a product or service to be considered as a potential for purpose. So what is, what is the perception of the customer and does the customer perceive the product or service as being something worth buying? Uh, that's a qualifier. And then the order winners, these are characteristics of an organization's goods or services that cause it to be perceived as better than the competition. All right. In the wonderful world of telecommunications and mobile phones, 
It really depends on who you talk to, but some people are going to say that uh, the iPhone is the best, and others are going to say that uh, other devices are the best. Uh, but what is it about the iPhone that causes it to be perceived as better than the competition? Well, the one thing is operating system. The uh, Apple iOS can only be found on the iPhone. You're not going to find that uh, Apple iOS on any other device, unlike the Android operating system, which is, in essence, on all the other manufacturing devices, Samsung, Nokia, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, so what sets iPhone apart from the Samsung, from the Nokia, from the other mobile device manufacturers, they all have the same operating system, but Apple has its own operating system. Uh, so that's an order winner for the iPhone. Environmental scanning is necessary so that we can identify internal factors and external factors. And internal factors within the organization are strengths and weaknesses, whereas external factors are the opportunities and threats. And this is your SWOT analysis, S-W-O-T, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, you know, we may do a SWOT analysis uh, before the semester ends, to be honest with you. I may put an assignment in. Uh, I think that is something that uh, that we need to do before we get out of business operations. So, uh, but that's uh, you know environmental scanning. That's it's necessary so that we can identify these things uh, and you know overcome. We can utilize our strengths, overcome our weaknesses, utilize our opportunities, overcome our threats. Uh, key external factors are things like economic and political conditions. You got the legal environment, uh, especially in globalization. If you're wanting to move your company uh, into another part of the world, there are going to be some political conditions associated with that. There's going to be a legal environment associated with that. Uh, another external factor would be technology, competition, and the different markets that you want to penetrate, uh, you know, with your product or service from your organization. Internal factors include human resources, your facilities and equipment, your assets, financial resources, your customers, products and services, technology, suppliers, and there are other things as well. But all of these are key factors, key internal factors when doing your environmental scanning. All right, operation strategy. This is the approach that, can, that, that is consistent with your organization strategy, and it is used to guide the operations function. All right. Looking at this uh, graph here, you see strategic operations management decision areas. So on the left side, you see that product and service design, this is a decision area. What, are, what, does this, what does the product and service design decision affect? That can affect cost, quality, liability, and environmental issues. Uh, a decision area of capacity. What does that decision affect? Cost, structure, and flexibility. And this is in your textbook as well. So go ahead and look in your textbook at the different decision areas and what the decisions affect. Uh, and be familiar with this because you may see it again. All right. So these are your strategic operations management decision areas. Now I want to talk about some specific strategies. Uh, there is the first one that I want us to talk about is quality based strategy. Now, this is a strategy that focuses on the quality in all phases of the organization. All right, top notch quality 
from customer service to product to technology to delivery time to whatever, all right? It's a pursuit of such a strategy is rooted in several factors. First off, you're trying to overcome a poor quality reputation, maybe. Uh, you desire to maintain a quality image. Desire to catch up with your competition. Or a part of cost reduction strategy. So these are the factors uh, that an organization may decide to use a quality-based strategy. Not only do we see quality-based strategy, but we see time-based strategy. Now, this, these are strategies that focus on the reduction of the time that's needed to accomplish a task. Uh, it is believed that by reducing time, costs are lower, quality is higher, productivity is higher, higher time to market is faster, and customer service is improved. So the focus and it's right there in the name, on time-based strategy is reducing that time. All right? You've heard, the, uh, you've heard the, uh, the phrase that time is money, right? So whenever you're saving time, you're saving money. Uh, so that, that kind of drives the time-based strategy. Uh, areas where organizations have achieved time reductions are like in planning time, uh, product and service design time, processing time, uh, changeover time, delivery time, uh, response time for complaints. These are some areas where organizations have achieved some time reductions which contribute to productivity. Not only do we see time-based, but also agile operations. Now, this is a strat strategic approach for a competitive advantage that emphasizes the use of flexibility to adapt and prosper in an environment of change. It involves the blending of several core values like cost quality, reliability, and flexibility. Uh, Verizon Wireless, we had a... Um, a motto, if you will, and it was said that change energizes us. Change energizes us. Now, I'm not so sure if I agree or disagree with that. Um, I think change just for the sake of change is, is just change. I mean, I'm not so sure that's an energizing factor. Uh, but if there is a purposeful change, if something is changed so that you can increase uh, revenues or productivity or quality, things like that, then that's a change that is, is positive. That's a purposeful change. Uh, so the agile operations, this strategic approach, emphasizes that flexibility we want to adapt because the it's an ever-changing environment that our organization lives in. Um, lastly is the balanced scorecard approach, and this is a, a top-down management system that organizations can use to clarify their vision, their strategy, and transform them into action, like develop objectives, develop metrics and targets for each objective develop initiatives to achieve objectives, and then identify links among the various perspectives. Uh, things like in finance and customer service, internal business processes, and learning and grow. Uh, and ultimately, in the balanced scorecard approach, you're going to have to monitor the results. If you're not monitoring the results, the scorecard, balanced scorecard approach is worthless. So in the balance scorecard, you want to balance your financial. This is the, uh, to succeed financially, you, we should appear, uh, how we appear to our shareholders. Customers is how do we appear to our customers. Learning and growth is how will we sustain our ability to change and improve. And then the internal business processes 
uh, are to satisfy our shareholders and customers, what business processes must we excel at? And uh, it, um, the balanced scorecard approach puts a balanced priority on all of these elements when it comes to vision and strategy. Productivity. Now let's move from strategy and let's talk about productivity. Productivity, folks, is a measure of the effective use of resources. It's usually expressed as the ratio of output to input. We'll talk about output and input here in just a moment. Uh, but productivity measures are useful uh, for tracking and operating units performance over time. And then judging the performance of an entire industry or country. All right. Now, why does productivity matter? Well, high productivity is linked to higher standards of living. Let's say it more simplistically. Higher productivity is linked to more money. <laughs> more revenues, right? As an economy replaces manufacturing with jobs with, with lower productivity, uh, service jobs, it's more difficult to maintain that high standard of living. Uh, not only does, uh, does high productivity link to higher standards of living, but higher productivity relative to the competition leads to competitive advantage in the marketplace, better pricing, better profit opportunities, all right? And then lastly, why does productivity matter? Well, for an industry, high relative productivity makes it less likely that it will be subplanted by a foreign industry. Here, can I say that simplistically? All right, uh, high productivity means that you won't have to shut down and sell out, all right? It means that you're gonna be alive and you're gonna be in business you're going to be making it happen. All right, so productivity, we can measure productivity. And in your textbook, there is, are some uh, formulas that, uh, that show us how to calculate productivity. Look right here, productivity, partial measures. We've got um, multi-factor measures. And then lastly is total measures. All right, so be sure, I just want to say this right now, is be sure and get into your textbook and look and know how to do these calculations. Now, I want to look at an example, uh, but before I look at this example, I want to remind us that output, when you see the output, like there's output right there, and then you got output over here, and there's output right there. Um, Output equals, that's the goods and the services, right? That's the product, all right? What is being produced? And then the input, like right over here, you got input. The input, those are the resources that are used in production. So we're talking about labor, materials, energy, things like that, okay? So... What I want us to do is let's do a little practice on productivity calculation. All right. Now, this is what I want us to calculate. I want us to calculate uh, the multi-factor productivity. Now, I'm going to remind you, here is this, this right here, this long line here. This is our multi-factor measure formula. All right. Specifically, look at this one right here. Output over labor plus capital plus energy. Uh, on our example, you're going to put output over labor, materials, and overhead. Okay? So there is the information, the productivity calculation example. Uh, and the question is, what is the multi-factor productivity? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a timer for 30 seconds. And then I'm going to come back and we're going to finish and I'm going to show you a solution. But once you see the paused screen, if you want to pause the video and then work on this and come up with an answer, then you can start the video back up and review. I can review the solution with you. All right. 
So go ahead and pause your screen now, 30 seconds, and then we'll look at the solution together as a class. On your mark, get set, go. solution together. So in our calculation, the information that we have is uh, units produced, 5000 The standard price is $30 a unit. The labor input is fi uh, 500 hours. Cost of that labor is $25 an hour. Cost of materials is $5,000. And then cost of overhead is two times the labor cost. So as we look at this together, the first thing we see are units produced, 5,000. So in output over labor plus material plus overhead, those 5,000 units goes uh, on top of the formula as indicated on your screen there. All right, so now that we've got the units produced and we're trying to calculate the output, we have to multiply that times $30 per unit. So we have 5,000 units. The standard price is $30 a unit. So in order for us to come up with the output, we multiply the 5,000 produced times the $30 per unit. And that's where we're going to get $150,000. That is our output. Now let's go to the bottom side of the formula and let's talk about the input. First, we have labor. All right, so we need to calculate the labor. We have 500 hours and the cost of labor is $25 an hour. So that's 500 hours times $25 gives us our labor cost. Now we need to add that labor cost to our material cost. So the cost of materials is $5,000. Now that $5,000 there is a pretty clean number there, $5,000. But just know that in a real life situation, your cost of materials is going to be a little more complex than just a good clean $5,000. You uh, may have to do some math because you need to add up the cost of nails versus the cost of plywood versus the cost of paint uh, and add that all together to discover or to calculate the cost of materials. But for our example today, our material cost is a clean $5,000. So now we've got our labor cost. We're going to add that to our material cost. And then lastly, we need, we're going to have to calculate the cost of overhead. And there on your screen, it clearly tells us that cost of overhead is two times the labor cost. So we already know that the labor cost is 500 hours times $25. So we'll just take that and multiply that times two. And then that's going to give us the overhead total. So now once we... Um, take our labor input, cost of labor, and add that to the material cost, and then add that to the overhead. That's going to give us our input, which is $42,500. So in calculating the multi-factor productivity, we would take $150,000 and divide that by $42,500, and that gives us 3.5294. All right, 
Now the question on the screen is what is the implication of an unitless measure of productivity? All right. Uh, the, the implication here, that 3.5294 represents that for every dollar that we spend, we are going to be able to produce 3.5294 units. All right. So that's what that 3.524 represents. 3.524, sorry, units of output are produced per dollar input. All right, does everybody see that? I hope so. Uh, if you don't, you can go back and rewind and look at it again. There are some examples in your book as well. And there are some questions, some practice that you can... Uh, do as well with the questions in the uh, back of the chapter. All right, very good, very good. Now, when it comes to productivity, we also want to measure productivity growth. And productivity growth is your current productivity minus your previous productivity over your previous productivity and then multiply all of that times 100. So look at this example. The labor productivity on the ABC assembly line was 25 units per hour in 2014. So in our example, if you remember, it was units per dollar. But in this example, we're looking at units per hour. All right. So in 2014, we had 25 units per hour. And I mean, in 2014, and then in 2015, labor productivity was 23 units per hour. So what was the productivity growth from 2014 to 2015? Well, you take the current productivity, that's 23, minus the previous productivity, that's 25, divide that by the previous productivity, that's 25, and multiply that times 100, and it gives us a minus 8%. All right? Minus 8%. So, in, in actuality here, we don't have any productivity growth, but we have productivity decline. All right? That minus 8% is a diminished figure. Now, if we had a positive 8%, um, then that would be a, a growth factor. That would, be, that would indicate that we had some increase uh, in productivity. It's pretty cut and dry. It's pretty easy. Um, but uh, the service, service sector productivity, now product versus service, uh, when we talk about the service sector productivity uh, it can be difficult to measure and manage and the reason is is because we're maybe we're dealing with uh, intellectual activities where uh, there's a lot of variability when it comes to our service productivity uh, a useful measure that is related to productivity uh, service productivity is what we call process yield uh, and it's where products, where products are involved. It's it's just a ratio of output of good, of good product to the quantity of raw material input. All right, that's what we looked at in our example. But where services are involved, that process yield measurement, and look in your textbook, find that in your textbook, process yield measurement. Uh, it's often dependent on the particular process. Uh, like ratio of cars rented to cars available for a given day, uh, ratio of student acceptance uh, to the total number of students that were approved for admissions. Uh, so that is a process yield measurement uh, versus, you know, a product over quantity of raw material input. Uh, so service sector productivity, be sure and look it up in your textbook. Now there are many factors that affect productivity. 
the methods that you use, uh, the amount of capital and assets that you have, the technology that you have access to, management decisions, uh, good management decisions increase productivity. Bad management decisions decrease productivity. Duh. Uh, quality, whether that be quality of employee, quality of product, quality of design, quality of all of the different areas of an organization's operations. Uh, so there are a lot of factors that affect productivity. So how do we improve productivity? Develop productivity measures for all operations. Number two, determine those critical bottleneck operations. Where is it that you need to maybe uh, make some adjustments to improve operations? Uh, develop methods for productivity improvements. Establish reasonable goals. Set the goals up at the end of the basketball court because if the goals aren't there, there's nothing to shoot for. But establish those goals. Establish reasonable goals. Make it clear that management supports and encourages productivity improvement. And then number six there, measure and publicize improvements. And then lastly, number seven, don't confuse productivity with efficiency. Now, efficiency, how well you do something, all right, uh, how quickly you can do something and still produce something of quality, that is efficiency, all right? Efficiency does help productivity, but efficiency is not productivity. I may be good at putting a radio together, all right, but being good at putting that radio together does not produce the productivity that the organization is accomplishing with its radio sales. Uh, so don't confuse productivity with efficiency. All right, all right, productivity. Chapter two, competitiveness. What is it? Competitiveness. Don't tell me. Let me look. Here we go. Competitiveness strategy. That's the word I couldn't find. And productivity. All right. So that is chapter two, ladies and gentlemen. And with that, this is Michael Davis saying, have a good whatever it is for you, if it's morning or afternoon or evening. Uh, but that is chapter two. Now, folks, read the material, do the homework, do the discussions, and uh, this Thursday we will be discussing chapter two uh, discussion in class. All right? All right, guys. See you later.